Okay, right. So there's the title. Um, the subtitle is more important. Right, so this talk comes from personal experience. I read a lot of papers as a referee, and I'm always tearing my hair out. Why did they do this? Um, so, uh, reading the introduction, you might read something like this, um, something like that, something like this, right? That was said by Dykstra probably in the 60s. Um, don't worry, I've only just started. Or the famous Ariane 5 rocket explosion, which happened when? Did anyone know it? Something like 1993? So it's always a mystery why people refer to things from the remote past when introducing their work. And I assume it's because these things were mentioned in whatever paper they read, and they thought, oh, that's a cool example. Um, Or again, I mean, of course, you're meant to love your subject, right? You're meant to really believe in it. So, of course, you're going to go to its history and right back to Plato. Why not? I'm sure you can find some connection between something Plato wrote and then you kind of go on to, oh, I don't know, um, Isaac Newton, say, and you can go into the 19th century, and eventually you'll arrive at your, your own subject. Um, the other thing... Let's say you're doing theoretical work. Typically, there's a lot of definitions. Um, so I work in the theorem-proving world, and you can have a lot of things about syntax, substitutions, unifications, occurrences of things. Um, that go, can go on for pages. Now, you don't need them all in your paper, but it's a lot of work to find out which ones you do need. And you've got a handy file that your supervisor compiled that you can just paste it into your paper. Um, and that's not only two pages, perhaps, but it's two pages of the most incomprehensible stuff you could possibly throw at somebody. Um, then, assuming your reader has got through all that, and they've read your paper, and, they, and then they suddenly, what's this future work thing? I, I have no idea when this craze of talking about your future work became suddenly assumed as part of your paper. You're meant to be writing about the thing you did, not the things you didn't do. Um, what you could be doing, clearly you need to understand the implications of what you did. So I have thereby addressed the problem of this, which bears on the desire to do that, or has a possible, especially a non-obvious application to that. Great. But often it's like, I could go back and do the thing I didn't do, that I told you I didn't do, and I will tell you again that I should maybe do it. Um, just don't, you know. There's a bit of common sense here. The other thing is the abstract, the introduction, the conclusion. Since a lot of people don't really get what they're for, um, they write something which is like a paragraph on their work, and then they stick it in as the abstract. Now it's the time to write the introduction. Oh, I know. I'll just use this paragraph again. And then it's time for the conclusion. Um, maybe you tweak the paragraph a little bit. Instead of saying, I'm going to show blah, now you say, I have shown blah, and that's your conclusion. Um, <coughs> if you find yourself in this mode, what you're doing is you're treating a paper as some kind of mysterious kind of haiku-like art form in which there are a lot of unwritten rules that you have to conform, and unless you do all this crazy stuff, you haven't written a paper. So maybe it's one could go back in time when scientists used to write letters to one another, and they didn't have all this bullshit then because they were typically just writing a letter to one person, and they would just say, I've been thinking about the following subject, blah, 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 blah. And of course, they wouldn't go through all this rigmarole. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. If you're doing all those bad things, why? Um, I said, maybe you're copying. And I have to say, 
a lot of papers out there could be better written, including my own. When I look at especially my earlier papers, I kind of think, what were you thinking? But no one ever teaches us how to write papers. I mean, I hope I am, and I hope I'm doing a good job, but a lot of times people are just um, copying what they have been seeing. And yeah, maybe your supervisor doesn't write very well. I mean, we are not hired for our writing skills, right? Uh, and you can have people who are geniuses, really, you know, I mean, literal, I'm not joking, literal geniuses at what they do, and they're awful at writing. Um, and it's a problem for them because clearly the other guy who's maybe not as smart but communicates really well is going to get the better of them. So it is worth putting a bit of effort into your own writing. Um, okay, then there is the old imposter syndrome. I have no immediate, I mean, and, and the funny thing is all kinds of people have imposter syndrome. I have no advice on this. I mean, this is, this is a, a serious issue that people might need to get help with one way or another. Um, but you don't want this to find itself into your paper. The thing is, you did a thing, if you're a supervisor, and I've known people who were absolutely brilliant and did great work in coming and saying, you know, I'm a failure, um, and then getting an award or something. And it is a typical thing that the people with imposter syndrome are often the smartest. So if you're feeling that, um, just, just bear this in mind. Um, Whatever the work you did, just let us have it. What you're trying to do is communicate your work to an audience. Oh, and by the way, of, of sorry, last thing is very important. Communicate your results. So communicating general ideas about why your field is important um, and if you've seen my, I have a, a kind of version of this on my website, one of the things people waste a lot of time doing is justifying their field itself. Um, why am I doing mobile computing, or why am I proving theorems, or why am I you know, building this type of system? There are occasions when you have to do that. So if you are going to be speaking in a situation where people have no idea what your field is, and it is very important to know exactly who your intended audience is. If you know you're trying to reach people who have no idea what your field is, then yes, you have to say what your field is and why it's valuable. But that almost never happens, especially when your students, mostly you're talking to people. Ah, now you, that's true. You have to be read by examiners who know very little about what you're doing. So yes, if you're writing a thesis for examiners, um, you will have to put some effort into explaining to them what your field is. But if you are explaining research in a specialist conference in your own field, the last thing the reviewers want to see is an explanation of why their field is wonderful, because they know that already. So what do they want to know? And <coughs> I've said it here. It really, I mean, I, I shouldn't read my own slide, but I mean, what did you do, right? And they shouldn't have to wait till page five to figure out what you did, why you did it. Um, and that's what your introduction is for. What techniques did you use? So this is what we call background. And background, as I said, try and keep your background brief. Keep everything to the minimum required. Finally, they want to know the details of what you did. Now, most people will skip this. Right? Let's, let's be honest. The detailed description of exactly how you set up your work and how you ran your experiments or built your system, whatever, most people are going to skip because they're not going to read the whole paper. Now, don't feel insulted by that. That's just how the world is. People are busy. The only people who are really going to read this are people who are so close to you that they want to maybe repeat your work or build on your work, and you need to be precise enough for them to be able to do that. However, you should always imagine that that part of your paper could be subtracted out and people could still understand 
in general what you did and how successful it was. Um, finally, it's time to discuss related work. Now, I know that there are some differences here. I, I met, you know, academics who say, well, you should, doesn't matter whether you discuss related work at the beginning or end, but it does because background is different. So when I say background, that's what the reader needs to know before they can understand your work. So if you're using a particular sort of system, you need to say what that system is. Um, you're using maybe a certain research methodology or a certain testing strategy or a certain type of machine learning. You have to say what that is, and that is background. Once you've described your own work in detail, now you're in a position to discuss other related work. You cannot compare your work with other people's work when the reader doesn't even know what your work even is. So you finish your own, you give your own results, and then you say, ah, those guys in that other place over near the Cotswolds, that, that pit of darkness, um, they did this and so, which of course was far inferior to us. Um, I'm joking, actually. You have to be nice in papers because those guys are probably going to be your referees. Um, for the conclusions, now the conclusions should be different from the introduction and the abstract because the conclusions are what was learned. So there should be, um, you did all this work, and one of the kind of ironic things here, in the, still in this building we have the old CAP computer which was built to explore so-called capability-based protection. They had it in hardware and their conclusion, having built this thing, was that capabilities were too inefficient to be of any use, even when supported in hardware. Um, I don't believe that is thought to be true anymore, but hardware has advanced since the 1960s. But they had, in this case, a negative conclusion, but that was what they learned. Now, you're not going to have, at the very, in your abstract, capabilities are no good, because then who's going to read your paper? They would have had, actually, I, I'm slightly talking through my hat here because I haven't read any of their literature. I've only had a description of that project. But in general, your conclusions may not be as promising as you'd like them to be, but nevertheless, the fact that you did the work in a particular way and arrived at a certain result could have very important consequences for the field as a whole. I mean, there are many examples of experiments which yielded a null result, and in fact, null result was in itself a very important conclusion. Okay, let's go in a little more detail at what we're looking at here. So your title, yes, please try to have a clear title. Remember how people are going to find your paper, because typically you get a proceedings Oh, God, they're not books anymore. They're online, but whatever. They're going to scan with their eye down the page, and they're going to look for something exciting. And if you've got a whole bunch of gobbledygook and lots and lots of um, obscure acronyms that most people haven't heard of, they're not going to look at you. Then the abstract. Um... I remember reading that the abstract should be three sentences. I think that is quite hard to accomplish. But you should certainly cut the abstract down to the bone, to the gist of what you did. That I invented a radically new sort of database system, that something, or I used through machine learning to recognize something. Um, and you don't need all the, the gory details in your abstract. Okay, so the paper as a whole. Of course, you introduce your work, and as I say, if you clear from your mind all the stuff you saw in the other papers, and just imagine, how would you explain to people that you want to communicate with? It can help if you know somebody, like one particular person who would be at that conference, or one particular person who would be at this other department where you're talking, and imagine them reading your paper, and what would they want to read? They, they knew the Ariane 5 exploded, and, you know, they don't care. 
that, that's just not relevant. So, so what would you write to tell that person why what you did was important? And yes, you can refer to preferably up-to-date literature that is setting a context for your work. Then, as I said already, the background, background literally refers to the starting point of your own research. So just as Newton said he was standing on the shoulders of giants, so it's those shoulders that you need to include in your background here, the, the, the starting point. But keep it, keep it to its minimum. Finally, you get to your own work, the things you actually did. We set up this, we dot that, this was our data, we ran it, and we analyze it as follows. And I know I've said all these already. I'm just trying to flesh it out a little bit. Finally, you discuss how well your, your work did, and you have your conclusions. OK, now let's have some examples. None of these papers are perfect. But um, I mean, you're being taught about tons and tons of things. And they're all based on early papers like this one here. It can be rewarding to go back and look up those papers. I and mean, while you're here, you have access you know, to all these journals, and you can look up any of these and just read them. Some of them, they're amazingly well written, and sometimes not. Um, sometimes they say very funny things. I, I think this paper came out in the 70s. So this is the abstract. Oh, by the way, what, what paper is this? Does anyone know what paper this is? That's right, the original RSA paper, which introduced um, the form of public key encryption which is used today. Um, and there are the authors, Rivas, Shamir, and Adelman, or whatever. Uh, there is their abstract. It's a very long abstract. Um, but in a sense, the, almost the whole content of the paper is just in this abstract. Um, I'm not going to read it all, but you can see how long it is. As I said, I think it is a little too long, but it's, it's, um, there's no bullshit in there. What's in the abstract is, I mean, the criticism you could make is there is too much of the details of the technique in the abstract itself where they could have simply had, let's say, they could have taken the top half, for example. But I, I, I'm not going to get angry with this. I mean, they, they didn't do anything bad here. There's really only one thing I hate, um, which is the asterisks near the bottom, right? When you're typesetting mathematics in your paper, typeset it as mathematics, right? Unless you really like E equals M squared asterisks, M asterisk C squared, um, and it looks awful, doesn't it? Well, that looks awful. I don't know why they did that. Now, that is the full introduction. Now, you can see how the abstract is a bit too long in the sense that the abstract is longer than the introduction itself. And, of course, it is kind of quaint. So the era of, quote, electronic mail, end quote, may soon be upon us. Well, yeah, it's quite amusing to read that now. But, you know, these guys were working in the era where a 32K machine might have been, you know, their main workstation. Well, they wouldn't have had a workstation. It would have been a departmental machine. Um, in some ways, I think this introduction might have been a better abstract than their abstract. But anyway, um, it, it's not a bad paper at all. Uh, there's one thing I hate here. Um, so, what, what did I dislike? So it said, an elegant concept introduced by Diffie and Hellman, and they refer to paper number one. The thing, and I know that what they have in the second occurrence of paper number one was already very common then, but it is ugly. Uh, and these numbers aren't words, and you don't need to write one when they could simply have said, readers familiar with that article or that work. And it would have been a much, much nicer little thing to read. Um, finally, the conclusions. 
um, the conclusions do not overlap with the abstract or the introduction. Um, and here, and it's quite interesting, for example, the second paragraph is now critiquing their work um, in a way that you could not have done in the abstract or the introduction. You've seen the work, and now in the conclusions. Now, I, I could argue this is not exactly right in the sense that these, the security of this system needs to examine in more detail is not a conclusion of the work, but I think one doesn't need to be dogmatic about exactly what you allow in the conclusion. It is certainly an important thing to say at this point, after the work, that the security needs to be examined in detail. Uh, in particular, if you could find a way of factoring large numbers, you'd be in big trouble, and we're still worrying about this now with quantum computing. So there we are. Nothing to do with future work. But so examining the, the security of the system could be seen as future work, but they don't put it in that way. Um, the, the problem with future work things is that they often do take this form of a laundry list of uh, typically obvious things that are an insult to the reader's intelligence. Um, now this, what I have in green there, is a crucial thing. You should expect that somebody will read, if they're interested in your work, read your abstract, read your introduction, and then skip directly to the conclusion without reading the background or any of the other stuff because they're in a hurry and have a bunch of other things to read. And they will evaluate your work on that basis. So your paper needs to make sense with just those parts of it, and you should not expect that the reader has read any of the stuff in the middle. So you need to have made, made sure that you've made all your important points there. That's also why you need to avoid repetitions in those places, because if your reader reads the abstract introduction and conclusions, and they're all the same, they're going to be mighty pissed off. Hence my subtitle. Okay. Ah, yes. This great paper is only seven pages long. I saw a question just last week. Should I penalize a paper that falls short of the word limit? I mean, what? So Roger Needham, our great head of department for a long time, said you should judge a paper by a signal-to-noise ratio. <laughs> right? Think of that, right? How much real, worthwhile content is there, divide it by the length, if you can say what needs to be said in seven pages and you've not overlooked important work and you've not left something that's incomprehensibly dense, then go for it. Okay, here's another paper. Um, okay, this title, they're starting to push the envelope here with the title. Um, but he is making a point, and in his abstract, he's referring to the apparently 700 programming languages that already existed, and he was proposing to capture the next 700 in this language here. He only ended up with one or two, but that's all right. Oh, by the way, this is your attendance question. <laughs> so that's his abstract. Um, again, maybe a little longer than it needs to be, but uh, you probably don't know what this paper is. So this paper invented what probably we now know as the syntax of OCaml, and it's kind of typical of the deep conservatism of the OCaml designers that they stuck with this syntax 50 years later. Um, even though overloading it with tons of other stuff, but forcing the same syntax to... to capture all these things. So Landon's paper was intending to make this one syntax based on the lambda calculus, which he claimed could be a framework for any other programming language that you might want to write. Um, now, as we know, many other languages have been developed since, such as Perl, for example, which look absolutely nothing like Landon's language, but never mind. Uh, here's his, uh, his abstract. Um, so I guess the main, the first sentence says everything he wanted to say, and possibly he said a little too much in all of that other stuff because you're then not going to 
certainly me, if you're in a lazy mood or tired, you're not going to want to read all that. So he probably should have shortened that. But he does cover the main points in six sentences. There's his conclusions. Um, now, again, there's no future work, <clears throat> even though the very nature of the paper is about future work because he's claiming to have laid the foundation of 700 future languages. <clears throat> so there's a certain amount of what I would normally have called this a discussion section. So um, I'm not quite sure I approve of the conclusions. Nevertheless, this is a very famous paper. Then there's this one. <clears throat> um, don't do this. Okay, yeah, if you're Phil Wadler, you can get away with this. In fact, Phil Wadler is famous. Uh, as I recall, his PhD thesis was entitled Listlessness is Better Than Laziness. Right, so he started early with the jokey titles, and uh, he, he's continued. Um, but normally, no one is going to, to pick up on that kind of title because they don't know, because you're not Philip Wadler, and so no one's going to recognize your name and say, oh, what's Phil up to now? Um, great abstract, however, and that is three sentences, and the three sentences say exactly what his contribution is. So this is really, this really is, as you compare, contrast this with those very wordy abstracts for the other papers, you can see uh, and, and maybe most of you know nothing about this work, and actually I don't know a lot about it, but I know enough that I could say, yes, if you have a certain kind of type system, um, if your function has a certain type, then there is a certain theorem which will be true of your function, and this is, can be shown from the type alone. So that is a cool thing. So there is the abstract. Now, it has no conclusions. Now, as we saw, the last two sets of conclusions kind of varied in what they were. I think it's kind of unfortunate here because you do want to know kind of what exactly is this for, which is not there. And in particular, this word parametricity, which he introduced in the paper and which subsequently became used quite a lot in other literature because this was an important discovery, um, it would be good to have a conclusion that said, we have introduced the notion of parametricity through which we obtain properties, etc. Um, so a bit more structure would have helped. Nevertheless, this is a truly famous paper. So, I mean, as I said, a lot of great papers out there, including the ones which I showed you, I showed them all as examples of and very good research, not always written up in the very best way, but certainly written up reasonably. Uh, and you might say, well, none of these papers really conform to the ideal that uh, you've been telling us. Um, as I said, try, you, you cannot squeeze yourself into some kind of predetermined format. Now, these authors have all, using their own ability, and you know, Phil Wadler in particular is very good at getting ideas across. Um, they find a system of expression that works for them, and uh, you have to kind of find your own voice as well. Now, moving away from the examples, uh, the importance of diagrams. Now, now, this one I got from the chicken paper. Has everyone come across the chicken paper? So you will find the chicken paper on the Internet. It's a very interesting paper. It's about chickens. Um, and it includes this diagram, and so this chicken process, it is very clear what is happening here, and I mean, it really is true that a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, so put a little effort, you know, get yourself a, some kind of decent vector graphic drawing program and make sure you include some diagrams. Um, likewise, graphs, this is also from the chicken paper, um, Clearly, not all research predisposes itself to such diagrams or such graphs, but if yours does, if you have a lot of data, for God's sake, 
presented in this way, people get tired of reading words. Um, get your tables right. Now, it is true, we are not designers, we are not publishers, and if we write like this, unfortunate, I mean, the, the chicken paper is exemplary in many ways, it's a bit repetitious, but they don't really do tables right. I think this is Leslie Lamport's fault because Leslie Lamport, he designed LaTeX and he put in this table system um, and he wrote his book and everyone copied his, his techniques, but his tables looked terrible. Um, I mean, no one's going to reject your paper because your papers look terrible, but it can contribute. You know, your reader is going to be influenced by a lot of subliminal things, and no one should imagine that we are rational people, right? So if you've got two papers, they're kind of equal in research quality, but one is beautiful and a pleasure to read, and the other, it keeps punching you in the face. Um, you're going to go for the beautiful one. So to make tables that look like this green thing here, um, I've given you that paper I quote, production quality tables in LaTeX. I should have made that your attendance question, then you would have remembered it and Googled it. <clears throat> um, but you can find it easily enough. Um, and the, the brief advice at the bottom here, don't have vertical lines, don't have double rules, and there is a LaTeX package which makes this very easy. So I hope you agree this second table, which contains essentially as much data as the first ta table, and yet it looks like it doesn't. And somehow, because it's less cluttered, it looks like there's a lot less there. What about related work? Um, a couple of points here. Firstly, this style, I see it all the time. All the time. Now, quite apart from the use of numbers, which we have already, I've already complained about, there's another problem. What is the problem here? There is not a single human being mentioned. Now, uh, even if chat GPT did the work, you should give it credit. So somehow all this stuff appeared in all these papers, but nobody was involved. And it is just so much nicer to read about our research community from people past and present. Pressburger, back in, I don't know, the 20s, proved this. Then Cooper, and you could put in the dates if you wanted, I think Cooper maybe in the 70s, improved that algorithm. Harrison, maybe someone has met Harrison at a conference, implemented this, and off. you see, it is exactly the same information, except it is suddenly much nicer to read. I'm sorry, it's not exactly the same information, because now you know who did what. Um, and yes, I, I don't have the usual vendetta against the passive voice that you see in some style guides. It has its place, but in this case, people did the work. A team, maybe a very famous team. Oh, and um, it's very common to justify your own work by saying how bad the previous work was. This is never a good idea, and some people have very thin skins. I don't like seeing criticism of my work. I want people to say, um, Professor Paulson's brilliant and groundbreaking work opened the door and gave me a new meaning to my entire life. And I then inspired me to further develop and open further doors. That is how you do it. You don't say this awful work, even if it was done in that other place. Um, <laughs> right, and we are, I mean, all of our work, and by the way, I, it's shocking to think about this, so most research is going to lead nowhere. You shouldn't feel bad about that because it is a fact. Just as way back when you, when you borrowed books from the university library and they used to stick, maybe they still do, I haven't borrowed a book in ages, they stick in the back the thing where they stamp the date when you have to return the book by. And I was puzzled that every time I borrowed a book, they would stick this thing in. 
I had, why didn't I have one already? And they would say, no one ever borrowed the book before. And this happened again and again and again. Uh, these were maybe books that had been there for 40 years and no one had ever borrowed them till I came along. Now, research is exactly the same. You write your paper, you do it, um, and maybe it will be noticed 30 years later. You know, Church's paper on higher order logic, which is in use so much now, he published it, I think, 1942, and probably almost nobody noticed it until Mike Gordon came along. Um, and so it's like that. you have no idea whether what you do is going to hit some target or not. But you at least try and make it clear so that when someone does come along much later, um, they will be able to read it. Anyway, let me continue. Now I'm going on to a few trivial bits of style. Um, so I know people struggle with having I in a paper. So the, the point is, you're writing about your work. You're not writing about yourself. And even if something awful happened to you which impeded your work, that probably doesn't belong in your paper. If something wonderful happened, you know, you met some wonderful person, had a great time, that doesn't belong in your paper either. So you won't have, and certainly now a thing I read in which I thought was ridiculous, in the conclusion saying how wonderful I felt, I, this work I found really satisfying. Um, that doesn't belong in your paper either, because just because you're satisfied with your work doesn't mean anyone else is going to feel satisfied. So if you keep your self out of your paper and write about your work, you won't find many occasions in which to refer to yourself. Now, sometimes you will say, I tried this approach and it was unsuccessful, and then I tried that approach instead. That's fine. Um, so you can, in that kind of situation, just, you know, you're not we, right? You're not the king. You do not get to refer to yourself as we. Um, now, it is possible to have a conversational style in your paper where you can use we as, for example, now let us consider the situation where we have uh, multiple processes or something. And now when you put it in that way, it's like you and I, and suddenly it's totally fine and feels very natural. Right. Okay. Now, this talk is not about how to write a thesis. I think you have a separate one. Some of the principles apply and some of them don't. And actually, I read a thesis and I don't know if it was my fault because he had decided to put all the background in chapter two. And of course, I said that you put the background after the introduction. So there was background material for about six other chapters all in this one chapter two, and some of it you had to go back a hundred pages back and say, what, what is he's using this thing, which is all the way back there. So it's you don't you cannot scale a paper size thing to something ten times bigger and expect it simply to work. So if I say if you contrast a flat, so imagine a paper is it like a flat. A block of flats is, of course, a block of identical things, which reminds me I'm currently reading a Danish PhD thesis which consists of a bunch of papers bundled together because that's how they do it in Denmark. It's certainly interesting. So it is literally a whole bunch of completely self-standing papers. Um, so these are all different things. So your dissertation, now we're not in Denmark, so you cannot simply have a bunch of independent papers as your dissertation. But equally, you cannot write a dissertation like one gigantic paper, because as I've just said, having all your background material in one giant background chapter, one of the stuff that is, the person's not going to get to until three weeks later when reading it, that is not going to work. Um, now, as I said, this talk is not how to write a thesis, so I am trying to kind of say how not to do it. So please don't, I mean, a lot of what I have said in this, in this talk does apply to writing a thesis, 
but mostly it is not being formulaic, focusing on communicating what you did to your reader. Now, and if it's a dissertation, you have to adapt what you do to the scale of a dissertation, and for that, you know, you have a different module on that topic, as well as lots of books you can um, have access to. So let me summarize. Um, just be pragmatic. As I said, keep saying, you're not copying anybody else. You are just taking your own work. Put in your paper, what do I want my readers to see? What do I want? When they turn the page, they will see this abstract. They will see this title. They will see this amount of introduction. They will see that amount of background material. Not too much, not too difficult. They will get to the meat of the paper very soon, like maybe by page three, and they will find it exciting and interesting and convincing. There will be diagrams for them. Then I will get to the end, um, and they'll feel good that they've read my paper and won't feel they've wasted their time. Right? Okay, and that's it. Yes, a question? Yeah. Um, if we shouldn't be using the word we because we're not royal or megalomaniacs, um, how do we kind of um, put forward? So, an example of that would be we implement an algorithmic inquiry with two dot dot dots. Um, how would you say that without using a pronoun like we? Um, you could if say. Okay, yeah, sure. If there's multiple authors, it's trivial, right? You're we, and that's that. If it's you, I'm, sometimes you can, you can use the passive voice, but that can start looking awkward. I think in an abstract, yeah, in an abstract, you don't want to say a thing has been implemented, but equally, do you want to say we have implemented or I have been? Typically, you do find the, the, the passive, in fact. So if we look at, let me see, let me go back to some of these abstracts we have here. Um, okay, when he says we can derive, that is clearly you and I. So his problem is solved. <laughs> so that's fine. Let's go back. Whoops. Sorry. Um, this one, a family is described. Now, I think here the passive voice works okay. You could argue that this is not the author speaking, but if you like, this is a sales pitch saying, what's happening in this paper? A family is described. Um, and there is one use of the passive, and then he can be in the active voice. The framework dictates the rules, blah, 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 and there is no need for I. And let's go back now to... Well, there, I would just use I. First, I tried this. It was unsuccessful. Um, yeah, I mean, you did it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tried this, and it was unsuccessful. And if, it, if, it, if it's multiple authors, it is always we. Of course. Okay. Yes. What have we here? This is also a passive. An encryption method is presented. And then the rest is, again, um, not in any way awkward. Now, if they said and said, we present an encryption method. That's, I guess, okay, but in fact, the way it is written in the passive voice, what have we got? We have gotten an encryption method. So we are putting the content, the most important thing is the encryption method, not who the guys are. Well, they became very famous afterwards. Um, I mean, after the fact that we came up with a new idea would be a news in itself because they were a very famous bunch of guys at that point. Let me just go back through these other abstracts again. Come on. This is kind of tiresome. Sorry, this takes a moment. So... Again, the family of unemployment commuting language is described. And it, it does seem quite natural, in fact. 
Okay, so I guess I've dealt with that question. Any, any others? Yes? Uh, to explain what you said about where have a letter work is located. Yes. Uh, specifically about if the event. Don't you think that sometimes it might kind of ruin the flow, having it be at the end versus from the back end of the related work to a method and experiment? Um, one needs to apply common sense. I, I, if I want any single lesson it is that you should not be feel tied up with a bunch of rules. And I don't want to be giving you a bunch of rules here. If you find yourself trying to do a thing and you're finding I'm having to repeat myself because it's in the introduction and then it's in the background and then it's in the related work, uh, if you can find a better way of organizing it that makes sense. I've had, the main thing is don't make your reader scream, right? If you've made them scream, then you failed, even if you conform to a whole bunch of rules. Okay, yes? One more question. Uh, uh, so what do you feel about papers that very much kind of break the mold and just kind of do what they want? As long as the information is clear, you think it's okay? Uh, yeah. Um, I think the, the Phil Wadler's paper is an example of that. Um, and I said, what makes me scream? What's exasperating? It's nothing to do with breaking them all. I mean, if you like having a three-page introduction that talks about a bunch of things that happened 30 or 40 years ago, um, is that, it, 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 maybe it's not breaking them all. It, it, it is, you can break the, role, the mold in a good way that communicates your idea. Now, I mean, there's a limit to how much you can break the mold. It's like it's very hard to have a table that has the surface of the table on the floor because how are you going to use it? So your introduction has to be first. Um, your background has to come before the actual work. The discussion of the work really has to come after, and any conclusions really have to come last. Um, and the rest is really up to you. Okay, are we done? Okay, well, thank you all.